I'm going to be talking about making zines for research impact. Has anyone here heard of zines before? Yeah, okay, does anyone collect zines? Oh, I've been reading them, okay, great. So there's quite, actually, hi, a few people I know in the audience, hi. Um, so I, I'm sorry if I'm going to be going over stuff that you already know, but I've kind of gone from a basis of maybe something people haven't heard about before. Okay, so you'll see on the back here, there's some copies of um, a zine that I've been distributing recently. And, um, and as my lovely introducer said, you're going to have the opportunity to take away um, one of these with you today. Okay, so... I'll give you a bit of background about the research project. I'm not going to go on and on about that, but I think it might help in order to explain why I used the method that I did for disseminating the research. So I carried out research with uh, one, com one community and a number of families in Greater Manchester um, over the course of two years. So I was looking at how austerity impacts on people's everyday lives. And I was interested in that because there have been so many media reports, talks in the House of Commons, you know, a lot of public concern about what austerity is and, and what it means to people, but there hadn't been much research that actually involved asking people what their experiences were, so enveloping that experience into research. So I'm an ethnographer by trade, and I guess that was kind of the easy option for me, but it also seemed to be the best fit. So if you're trying to explore everyday life, what better way to do it than to get involved in somebody else's everyday life? So I did that for two years, um, explained the grey hair, and I was looking in particular, like I said, on the, this impact of austerity on the everyday, but I'm really interested in people's identities, fluid and otherwise, and also their relationships, how people relate to those around them and to, um, and to themselves, past, present and future. So particularly interested in gender, class and intergenerationality, and that will become a little bit clearer again shortly. So there were maybe four key findings. I'm still working through all that data. For those of you who do ethnographic research, you'll know there's a lot of data to get through. Um, the first main finding is understanding austerity as a personal and a, a social condition as much as an economic and political one. And by condition, I mean that it also conditions citizens and individuals in particular ways. Also, austerity has been something that's distinctly gendered. So the impacts of austerity are felt hardest by women in society. Part of the reason for that is because women bear the brunt of a lot of austerity cuts. They're one of the main recipients, one of the main workers in, um, well, the key group of workers in the public sector. So this kind of gendered element really came out too. Also thinking as well about how when, when policies are made, they always hit in context, right? They're not abstract. And the problem that we've seen with austerity is that we've had a number of public sector cuts made at the same time. And what's happened is those cuts, for the most part, have been hitting on the same group of people. So this cumulative effect was something that was important too. So these aren't necessarily the most accessible of results, right? How do you turn your words and your ideas into something that um, is meaningful to people and their own lives. Okay. So when we think about research impact, I mean, it's something that comes up so much more often to date. When I put in my fellowship bid, there wasn't even a section for it on there, and that was only a few years back. There's been a real kind of turn towards thinking about who, who we should be speaking to as academics, who we should be listening to as well, and how we engage with other people. Um, sometimes, I don't know about you, but you can feel a little bit torn. Is it that your institution wants you to do it? Or do you just feel a sense of social responsibility yourself? I know for me, I really felt that, you know, people had taken part in this research for two years and they'd given away so much of themselves to me that I wanted to give something back to them. I know that sounds corny, but it's true. And you also want them to know that their research matters and that it goes somewhere and that people are listening. So we can talk about impact, we can talk about engagement and knowledge exchange and you know what, I don't know exactly where all these ones begin and end but they all kind of seem to mesh together for me with the example I'm going to give you. I wanted to think about how, how I could not only engage the public, the general public, in interesting ways in the research but also to do it in an accessible way because 
when I would say to people that I do ethnography, I mean, that's not a common word, is it? It's not common lexicon. My dad still thinks I go to school, so what hope have I got for explaining what my research is about? Sorry, Dad. Um, but also the approaches that we use. Being a geographical feminist political economist isn't really the shortest kind of sub-discipline to be, to be from. But also thinking about dissemination, and you know, this was in the abstract I submitted, but I really want to kind of hammer this home, that I wanted to go beyond those hefty reports that we see online that take you at least five minutes to download, and then you don't want to print them off, do you? Because, I mean, it's like two trees worth. Also, the language that's used, so really florid academic language that grates on me at the best of times in academic journals, but it doesn't mean anything, right? And sometimes it can actually do the work of of making something completely um, illegible and removes it from any substance, I think. Also, you know, I came up against closed door conferences, so even more recent research that I've done trying to bring along um, co researchers that I've been working with in a participatory way. Oh, you know, you can't come and present unless you give us you know, £150 to come along as well. Well, you know, how, how do we get around that if our if our institutions are set up so that the very people you want to engage in your research have to pay or be of a certain group to be part of them. And so when I said before about how I was interested in gender and class and intergenerationality, for me, f I felt that I would be feeding in to some of the very kind of social structures I was trying to argue against if I only went for some of these ways of engaging. And the other thing is steep paywalls. We know that there's been a, a change in more recent years, so journals have open access, even some books too, but ultimately that's only the minority, right? So there'd be no point in me only writing in those avenues if I wanted the public to be able to, to get involved. And like I just said, I also wanted to make sure that I found a way to communicate that wasn't age specific, that wasn't gender specific or class specific, um, and didn't assume too much of people's background. And I don't want to necessarily just say education, but cultural background as well. So I guess for me, part of the reason why I went with doing zines was to not only inform and to maybe enlighten and to maybe empower some people, but also not to patronise them. And I think our research really has to be careful uh, about that line as well. OK. So, um, Feel free to, to join in if there's something that I miss out when I describe what zines are. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because when I have met people and talked about the zines, more often than not, people don't know what they are. And, um, and it's really great to be able to explain to people what their value might be. So they are a grassroots form of communication and they were typically and are typically used to empower marginalised groups. In more recent years, probably the last 10 years, they've become a little bit more uh, fashionable and I don't say that in a degrading way, it's, it's just that more people are likely to have, have heard of them. They also tend to stick to certain generations, so it tends to be that you know, certain generations are more affair with them. Um, they're very much about DIY, they're about subcultures, they're not about publishers publishing your work for you or getting an agent. It's like the exact opposite of that, okay? So some people might call them pamphlets, some people might call them booklets, but the term zine tends to kind of be used quite often. They're often used in political movements, so feminist movements, civil rights movements, queer movements. There's a, a lot of zines that were made um, throughout those waves and, and currently. So they're self-published, like I said, and they're produced within and for the community. So it would be that you produce a zine about something that you've done with people and you'd want to distribute it there first, um, rather than you being an outsider and you know, giving your zine to try and, try and educate a group that you've never been a part of before. So I'm, I'm not a zine maker, okay? I have an interest in them. Um, I realised when I was doing this that I think I made my first ever zine when I was about six about birds, which I don't think at the time I thought it was a zine, I just thought it was a nice booklet for me. But I've always been very interested in making and creating and, and doing things in an imperfect way because we live in an imperfect world, right? Um, but I am not the most creative when it comes to drawing. So I did draw on the skills of other people and that's the other thing about zines, they can be really collaborative, right? You can do it on your own, you can work with other people. Um, 
they're meant to be free as well, or at, le at the very least, they're meant to be non-profit. Okay, so as a maker, I would never get any any kind of uh, money from handing that out. But as I say, because I'm I'm not necessarily from the zine community, I've just got an interest in it. I've got friends who are zine makers. Um, I I found my foray into it really interesting. I learned so much about about some of the etiquette around zines. So for some people, they feel really strongly that zines should, in the very first instance, if only, they should be uh, made and photocopied and distributed by hand. That they, uh, some people don't feel like they should go online. If it goes online, then it's not a zine, right? So I came up against a lot of these kinds of norms that I had no idea about, maybe tread on a few toes, but it was quite nice to get to learn about something that I hadn't, I don't know, I'd not really explored all that much before. I also found some stuff around zine ethics, so how you cite zines, um, how you might use them, how you might share them with people. And I don't know if any of you know, but we have a zine library here in Manchester, the Salford Zine Library in the Northern Quarter. And there's zine libraries in most cities and many towns across the country as well. So do go and check out Salford Zine Library. When you go in, it is just what it sounds like. It's a library full of loads of incredible, incredible zines on the walls. And I put a picture behind, but you, you can't really see. But what really strikes me about it is how colourful they are. And also the, the smell, like it just reminds you of going back to school and being in the craft room. So there are a few different ways that people make zines. And for me, coming to this as a, a newbie zine maker, apart from volume one of birds, um, I, uh, I, I came across this image that's used quite a lot on lots of different blogs about how to make zines. And this is kind of the blueprint of making a simple zine. And what you'll see is it's kind of split into eight boxes. You've got six lots of content, and then you have a back and a front cover. Okay, so this is kind of the, the norm and then the other side is blank or you can use it for something else as well. Okay, so I saw this and I thought this has the potential to, to be something a bit different, a bit experimental. I'd not seen a zine about austerity um, and I thought okay, maybe this could be a way not only to engage the public but I wonder if my academic colleagues and policy colleagues would know much about it too because ultimately we might have a job at one part you know one part of the day but we are also part of the public for the rest of our lives right so I kind of thought well, maybe it's a way to engage lots of different people luckily so you know the, the um, thing I had before that there were six different um, six different sheets well luckily I had uh, it was six families that I worked with so I chose an ethnographic vignette from each family and um, how you do that, I guess, is up to you. I have this kind of, I just have this thing where when you do ethnographic work, you, you almost already seem to be analysing while you're there or when you come home or when you're on the bus or you're always thinking about it. And I always think it's like sifting that the nuggets stay in the bowl. So for me, I chose the stories that kind of stuck with me because I thought if they stick with me, they might stick with other people as well. So I did actually choose two or three for each family and then I spoke to Claire who did the drawings and I asked which ones she thought might be most appropriate. She then turned these into a series of drawings. Um, I got a small pot of funding from the university and she drew those to that budget. Um, so of course I recognise that's not available to everybody and so for the next scene I do, I think I may draw it myself. And I don't think I'll be making that many of those. Um, but yeah, there are lots of different ways to do it. And I, I actually really enjoyed that collaboration. And it showed me that it just, you know, just having a chat about the language that might work or how the pictures might look or just chatting about the layout and what order it should go in and, and maybe who I could send it to. And, you know, that, that to in and fro in and having a conversation about it was really important. Um, being able to trust what she'd draw, been able to trust her with my findings as well, been able to communicate when there was something that you know I wasn't too keen on. So you, you will see shortly that um, 
the uh, typeface or the, the font that was used initially, I, I really wasn't keen on it. It took so much for me to send an email and say, I'm really sorry, I don't like it. But then it turned out that, they, that she had her own made font made from her own handwriting, which worked perfectly and I'm very happy with it in the end. But then also, ultimately, not being like really overbearing and recognising that it's a shared project. The zine is as much hers and my participants and yours shortly as it is mine. And I think what I really enjoyed about doing this was um, it teaches you to give away a little bit of, of your research and, and not be too controlling over it as well. Not that I'm like, Ugh, about it. So, to give you a slight glimpse while we're just putting, I'm just going to hand these out. I've got some colour versions and I really wanted to experiment with lots of different ways of doing it. So, what you've got in front of you is an example, well it is, what the zine looks like. Okay, and then what you've got on the other side is a poster that ends up being a surprise poster. Okay, I've printed off 60 copies so that they sh if there's any spares, can you send them back please? Okay. What I'm going to show you how to do is you're going to fold the piece of paper in front of you. You're going to fold it this way on the long edge. Is that all right if I do it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> you got it folded on the long edge. Okay, and then open it back up. And then you're going to fold it on the short edge. Yeah, put it back up. And then you're going to fold each of these in so it meets the middle. Okay. Okay. Then when you open the sheet up, you've got your eight different boxes on there. And you fold it in half then. You can see all your lines on it. And then, I know we've gone a bit blue Peter, sorry. <laughs> Living a childhood dream. Um, and then you cut, you cut up in the middle bit on the fold, okay? So the folded at the bottom and you cut up to that halfway point. I'll send some scissors round in a minute, but I'll show you what happens then. So then you've got a gap in it here, right? And then what you do is, you've got the cover here, that folds over, and then your inside folds to make a book. Mm, yeah? <laughs> I didn't make this up, okay? I'm not taking credit for this. But um, I'll send some scissors round, and you're welcome to have a go at it. Um, and come and ask me any questions you've got in the meantime. <laughs> One of the ones I've been distributing, I've been putting a card outer on it with a postcard that people can tear off and fill in about their experiences of austerity. So it's kind of a way to like keep on feeding back. But for now, you've got, you've got the main bulk of it, so hopefully you'll be happy enough. If you want to have a look at the website, I've also done an exhibition as well with a different artist drawing the same vignettes and I collected materials from my ethnography. So I've had a, an exhibition that's been going around. Um, I started tweeting about a year ago. It's great. Tweet me and email me if you, if you want anything or want to chat. Okay.